Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Dennis Doster, Black History Program Manager at the MNC PPC, Department of Parks and Recreation, Prince George's County. And on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Gina Vaughn, we are serve as co-chairs of the annual Juneteenth uh, observance. And I'd like to welcome you tonight as we delve into this important discussion on this virtual uh, panel discussion. And so I don't wanna take up any more time. I wanna take it uh, right to our moderator for the evening, who is Ms. Shakia, Mrs. Shakia Gillette Warren, an experienced museum professional and one of our new colleagues that we're so happy to have here in the Department of Parks and Recreation. And she will be serving as the inaugural manager of the Concord House Museum, uh, which will be delving into interpretation and programming around African-American history and culture. So please stay tuned to our social media to learn more about that site as it comes on board. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Shakia. Thank you, Dr. Doster, for the wonderful introduction and for setting the pace for this evening's program. Once again, good evening, virtual visitors, and thank you for joining us tonight. As a part of our long tradition of working actively toward improving and diversifying historical perspectives, we are proud to present to you Finding the Path to Healing, Addressing Historical Trauma and the Black Experience. Topics like these help us address timely issues in order to tell the stories of everyone who calls this region home. I wanna first applaud each of you for participating in this discussion. Tonight's presentation may feel uncomfortable at times, but it is important to create a space where dialogue and deep discussion may happen. We acknowledge that each of you have different vantage points based on your lived experience, but please utilize this time to listen to different perspectives and gain knowledge. During tonight's discussion, our expert panel will address ways in which historical trauma imposed by slavery and racial terror campaigns, both past and present, have had profound effects on the current approach to community healing. Just to give a bit of context to the term historical trauma, historical trauma is defined as a complex and collective trauma experienced over time and across generations by a group of people who share an identity, affiliation, or circumstance. We are honored to host this program and grateful to our guest panelists for sharing their viewpoints with us this evening. Tonight's discussion will run for about 45 minutes, which includes a moderated discussion and a 15 minute Q&A. At this time, I'm going to give our guest panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and tell us how they became involved with the healing movement and how tonight's Juneteenth topic resonates with them. So coming to the stage, we have Dr. Carlton E. Green, Kiara Holliday, Dr. Kyla Leggett Creel, Shala Johnson, and Dr. Izetta Mobley. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. How is everyone doing? Doing Good. well. Doing well. Doing well. Doing wonderful, great. wonderful, wonderful. So we're gonna take about <laughs> five minutes for each of you to just introduce yourself to our virtual guests. And then we're gonna get started with our moderated discussion. So first up, uh, Carlton, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you so much, Shakia, for having us um, this afternoon. I really appreciate being here. I am Dr. Carlton E. Green. I am a licensed psychologist here in the state of Maryland, as well as the Director of Diversity Training and Education at the University of Maryland College Park Campus. I am here in Largo, Maryland on the uh, original land of the Piscataway people, so I wanna pay honor to them. Um, I think that it's also important as I, even as I talk about myself as being a psychologist, I'm somebody who has been in higher education for the past almost 30 years, I think it's it's been. Um, for me, being a part of this conversation, as well as becoming a healer, had a lot to do with growing up in black neighborhoods um, and being a church boy my whole life and kind of beginning to see when I was a young adult that there was a lot of hurt in the black church spaces where I was finding myself. And I was, a, I was realizing that um, whereas a lot of people were coming to get some healing from the black church spaces, um, there wasn't a lot being said about the mental health of people. 
um, within those spaces. And so for me, it kind of catalyzed a journey where I began to seek out um, training related to become a psychologist, well, to become a mental health therapist. And then I got drafted into a PhD program um, where I was able to study and, and really um, think more about race and racism and racial identity in the world and what that means for um, people of color, but black people in particular. Um, right now, as we think about where we are in the context of Juneteenth, I think um, a big piece of the Juneteenth um, uh, story is about liberation. And where I find myself these days is really thinking a lot about what is needed in order to be able to liberate black, black people in particular. What are we doing in our schools, in our communities, in our churches to actually facilitate um, black futures, um, which is actually um, language that I've gotten from some black women colleagues that I've been working with um, in, a, in a program called Academics for Black Wellness and Survival. And so for me, that's really the big piece here. How are we talking about liberation? Are we focusing on the liberation of black people and really trying to promote black futures? So that's me. Thank you all for having me. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Next up, we have Kiara Holiday. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I am Kiera Holiday. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I am licensed in DC and Maryland. Um, and kind of what got me into the work that I'm doing, it started off from a place of hurt, but it guided me to the beautiful work that I'm doing. I think it took me directly to where I'm supposed to be currently. Um, I'm originally from PG County, Maryland. I attended Largo High School when I was at um, I attended Largo High School. And during that time while I was there, my boyfriend at the time, he actually committed suicide. Mm. It's definitely a tragic loss that I experienced, but it was something that completely shook my school. And I can say our community because it was something that we didn't know, had never heard of in our community. Mm -hmm. So from that, it led me onto a path. And I said to myself, I was just like, I don't ever want to be that close to someone and not be able to help or kind of know how they're feeling or whatever the case may be. But it just led me on a path to kind of just doing some healing work. And it really just opened up um, something that was inside of me that I didn't know that was there. And so I got my master's degree from Howard University School of Social Work. And since that time, I have done a lot of direct work in the community, in the child welfare system, criminal justice system, and some in like uh, I can say medical social work. But while doing that work, it really was just, to be quite honest, disheartening to see mm -hmm. people coming and needing and wanting the help. But because of the, I don't want to say government oversight, the systems, whatever agencies that you're working for, funding, whatever the trends are in that moment, not truly being able sometimes to provide the best help and or do what's in the best interest of the person sitting in front of you. And that is against my personal ethics. I feel like I'm put here on this earth in order to change, inspire lives and make a difference in people's lives. I think that's what my calling, that's why I'm here. And so if I'm in a space in a place where I can't do that fully, it just isn't a good fit for me. And so that led me onto a path and a journey to start my own practice, um, which is district counseling. I started that in 20. 19 and was definitely on the front lines of everything that was happening in 2020. Um, I had the opportunity, me and one other um, person on my team, we had over 800 therapy sessions. And so that just kind of led me to that work and really just being able to do exactly what the client needs. Um, and so that's kind of why I'm here. Thank you so much, Kiara. Thank you for your honesty. Um, I am excited and let's see. Shala, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, yes. Um, thank you guys also for being here. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, my name is Shala Johnson. I'm 19 years old. Uh, I'm a Heart Smiles Heartbeat. I'm a Healing for Lions ambassador. Um, I'm also the founder of my own business called Mentoring the Basketball Changing Lives, where I take myself and mentor youth through the sport of basketball ages 8 through 18, um, through the sport of basketball. But, you know, I also have I try to make opportunities where I open doors for the youth behind me to come in and, you know, take a good steps and, you know, follow positive role models, you know, leadership, accountability, people that have those type of character traits inside of them. You know, I want to basically have that around me and my team for basically the kids that I mentor to basically have something to look up to. So um, I started my own business called Mentoring the Basketball Changing Lives. And um, I got tied into with Healing Youth Alliance with um, Dr. K, Dr. Kyla. 
Um, she has like been the best, but you know, healing for lying is kind of teaching me more about the mental health aspect and basically things I can take back to my community to help the youth. Awesome. Thank you so much for your work. Um, Izetta. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Izetta Autumn Mobley, and I am joining in from Piscataway and Nakochink land in what is now known as Washington, D.C. I'm a fifth generation native Washingtonian, born, bred, and very proud. Um, and I come to this work as an academic and a scholar and as a museum practitioner and someone who has worked in museum sites and with public history. And one of the reasons that I find myself drawn to thinking about historical trauma is in part because you can see how that historical trauma gets lived out when people come to visit sites, um, when they are learning about new pieces of history, things that they never knew before, and how that changes their concept um, of themselves or the country that they're in or how they see the world. Um, and so I think that having discussions about trauma and historical trauma and healing and what that looks like is really important. But I also think that history and accurate history is a tool to combat some of the gaslighting and some of the other things that contribute to um, people not understanding the impact of history in their lives. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Kyla. Hi, good evening, everyone. It is an honor to be here. My name is Kyla Liggett Creel. I'm an assistant clinical professor at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Um, I've had the unusual and wonderful experience of, I grew up in uh, Shaw in uh, Washington, D.C. and attended Shiloh Baptist Church, which, was, uh, which is a church that was founded by 21 runaway enslaved people. And it was a center of the civil rights movement um, in Washington, D.C. And we had, you know, phenomenal world-renowned leaders such as Martin Luther King, Barack Obama, come and teach about the importance of history and civil rights and understanding systemic racism. And so by sitting at their feet and learning from them, um, I, I grew up in the inner city where, you know, I was 10 the first time I saw a dead body. And I didn't know that, you know, other people were getting crisis response and mental health support. It was just like, oh, yeah, that's what happens and just move on. Um, you know, we didn't have mental health services in my school when there was a crisis or a shooting or somebody died. You know, in my high school, I went to high school in um, Prince George's County at Central. There was a shooting in the school. We didn't have crisis response to help and, and help us talk about it. And not only was there a lack of healing and crisis response and mental health services given to those of us who were experiencing and witnessing trauma every day in the urban environment, but also the education that we received was not equitable. And so when you look at the demographics of the school, you know, I was going to predominantly black schools, graduating honors, you know, at you know, honor roll, going to college, thinking, okay, I've gotten this great education, and I go in, and I have to go remedial everything. And so that started my process of saying there is an inequity that is occurring in this country around healing and education, and it's based on racism. And that there are systems of oppression that are in, put in place that are holding people in a harmed and traumatized space. And so that made me start asking questions. And so I went on and got my bachelor's um, in family studies with a focus on the African-American family and my master's in social work at Smith College, uh, which is an anti-racist institution. Uh, and then I went straight to Baltimore. So I've been working in Baltimore for the past 21 years. I was a family therapist for 11 years working with um, families who've experienced trauma. And for the past 10 years, I've been working in West Baltimore. Um, in a place-based initiatives, working with grassroots organizations, focused on doing the work of healing and breaking down systems of oppression and addressing racism. Uh, in the past year, I've had the honor of um, developing a program called the Healing Youth Alliance, which you heard Shala speak about. And this is a program 
specifically for African-American youth, because I looked around and said, well, wait a minute, we're in a majority minority city. 61% of Baltimore City is African-American, but when you look at the social workers in the schools, most of them are white. Most of them are white women. There's a disconnect. So I started a program with Black Mental Health Alliance and the, um, and Heart Smiles, where we work with African American faculty from the School of Social Work and Black Mental Health Alliance to teach African American young people about their history, their culture, um, understanding what systems of oppression look like, how they function, and also how to break them down. And so uh, we have graduated 20 youth from the program in the past year, and they have um, gone on to train over a thousand people around the impact of racism on African American youth, as well as um, healing centered engagement to help with the healing process. So I am honored to be here this evening, and thank you. Wonderful. And Kyla, actually, everything that you just stated leads into our first question for the evening. So just to jumpstart our discussion, Kyla, could you please give, your, give the audience an overview of the Healing Maryland's Trauma Act and the origins of Baltimore City's Healing Act? Absolutely, and thank you for asking. And I'm gonna start in Baltimore and then go to the state because that's how we do in Baltimore, you know. Um, so there's, there's a wonderful, wonderful councilman, um, and Zeke Cohen. And Zeke Cohen's mom is a social worker, actually taught at Smith, where, where I was a student. And he really wanted to um, look at Baltimore City and say, we need to have a healing environment. We've been talking about trauma for 20 years. And that's important. We have to recognize trauma and we have to talk about it, but we have to focus on the healing. And so he did some work with um, community groups, community members, pulled together a movement called the Healing City Movement, and they drafted what's called the Elijah Cummings Healing City Act. This was passed in February 2020, and the main components of the act were that um, city programs that service um, youth, children, families, and um, older adults would be identified so that we had a comprehensive understanding of what services were there. That a citywide strategy for organizational cultural shift into trauma responsive city government would be developed. And it's very clear with this act that you cannot, you cannot separate trauma from racism. It, 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 it's all connected. You can't do trauma work and not address racism. It's not possible, especially because there are people of color who are experiencing trauma every day with microaggressions and all of this happening. So you have to address both at the same time. So it's building a healing um, system while breaking down a racist system. The initiative also had to be evaluated so that this we could say, here are the outcomes from the work that we're doing and that city leaders and city employees would be trained on trauma-informed care and healing-centered engagement. Everyone, every single person, from the bus driver to the janitor to the city councilman to the mayor, they're all trained on trauma-informed care. And that best practices, information about best practices would be put out so that agencies would get the best information on how to create a healing environment. And again, all of it has to be done with an equity lens. You cannot do healing work without having equity as part of the conversation, a lead in the conversation. And then every year there would be a report that would um, uh, you know, represent what the outcomes were. Also, a core tenet of this act was to create a task force, and that's actually where I was five minutes before this meeting, uh, a trauma task force that had representation from community members. So this is not a top-down approach. This is, this is a flatline approach. So we have city council, we have mayor, we have teachers, we have parents, we have children, we have youth. So, you know, the youth work group on the task force, are the three co-chairs are all young people between the ages of 18 and 24. So um, that task force is responsible for implementing this entire bill. So this bill was signed in February 2020, and it was so phenomenal, and it's such a great example that Maryland quickly took that bill and said, well, we want to do the same thing. So that bill was then passed in April of 2021. And it's the same idea, just putting it at the state level. So that instead of looking at city organizations, you're looking at state level organizations. And the intent is to say, we as a state need to be about the work of equity and healing. And so that's why this, this uh, bill is extremely important and very exciting. 
Thank you. Okay, Carlton, I'm gonna pull you into this conversation now and ask the next, the next question. So how has anti-Black cultural violence affected the psyche of African-Americans, both past and present? You're muted. I muted myself, okay, there you go. Um, I was really listening to Kyla and thinking about um, what, what, what she was describing, so like the system of racism and thinking about a systemic approach is really needed um, in order to be able to address it. And um, when I was thinking about this question around anti-Black cultural violence, I was thinking about the system, right, of anti-Black cultural violence. And your, your uh, question is about the psyche. So I wanna talk a little bit about the attitudes um, that, that might manifest among Black people in particular as a result of anti-Black cultural violence. When I think about it, um, I, I generally come to this notion of sort of like thinking about anti-Blackness in particular. Um, and a lot of the work that I do on campus when I'm, when I'm talking to people about it, to, to be able to really lay it out, I talk about um, from, the, from some of the literature, the longstanding and really persistent cultural disregard for Black people in America, thinking about society's preoccupation with and striving toward Black social death, the erasure of Blackness from all forms of social life as Black people are positioned as the embodiment of the problem in America, the persistent imagery and discourse that construct Black people and Black culture as devoid of value. And there was a great article back um, after the murder of George Floyd um, that, a, that a scholar wrote, and it was called, um, call it what it is, anti-Blackness. I would encourage people to go and find it in the New York Times. And she wrote in there that, that anti-Blackness is more than just racism against Black people. That would actually take away the sting of what it actually is. She says that anti-Blackness describes the inability to recognize Black humanity. Right, Black people are rendered as inhuman or unhuman or subhuman or superhuman in, in some cases, right? But just not human, right? And so when we think about that, what it really means is that as Black people, we have been really robbed of our humanity. We've been robbed of our capacity to be able to um, determine who we will be, to name ourselves or who we, who we can be in this world. It really facilitates a sense of internalized racism for, for many of us. Um, and, 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 and probably many of us have an internalized racism that we're always working through. It causes us most importantly to value whiteness and white cultural standards while also denigrating anything that is associated with blackness or with black people. And so the result is, is that not only does so like anti-blackness teach everybody else to devalue our own um, humanity, we learn through anti-Blackness to, to not value our own, own humanity as well. Some of the ways that that can manifest, and I just kind of want to run a few, th few things here, is that it really facilitates a sense of self-hatred, right? You can see self-hatred manifesting in sort of like how we can be violent with each other, um, indiscriminately violent sometimes with each other. And not to say, I want to be really clear, I'm not blaming Black people for that. I think it's what we've been taught about ourselves that can manifest as self-hatred, that we can then um, devalue other people. And certainly capitalism and poverty and those types of pieces factor into that as well. I think that there's a sense of shame that comes along with anti-Blackness. You can think about it very concretely if you look at Black children in schools who grow up being very smart, and then they get to a place where they begin to learn that to be smart might be equated with whiteness. And so we begin to shed our smartness in order to be able to fit in or to um, not necessarily be perceived as white. We become ashamed of something that has been really important to us over the course of our lifetime. Um, you can also see the shame um, manifesting in itself when people experience racially traumatizing events like police violence or you experience racism or microaggressions in your workplace setting. And we immediately think, well, what's wrong with me? Why did that happen to me? Did I do something that brought that on, right? We really can, can internalize the shame and it makes us think that there's something wrong with us. Um, I was listening to, um, and I would suggest to people to get the new book by Tarana Burke and Brene Brown. Um, Austin Channing Brown has an essay in there and she talks really about the inability, our inability to experience pleasure and joy and vulnerability in the world. Um, that's what anti-Blackness robs us of. We can think about it really clearly around Black men, our inability to be able to talk about our vulnerabilities or our hurts or our disappointments, right? We always have to show up in ways that are strong rather than any, anything that, that's vulnerable. Um, 
You can think about hopelessness. If you think about how Black people have historically shied away from participating, um, and you know, certainly this is changing, but have historically shied away from participating in voting in this country, right? There's a sense of hopelessness that it just won't work for us. Or even if you think about Black folks who don't think about or participate in their own mental health or their own well being in ways, a sense of hopelessness that takes us away from um, thinking about that. Um, there is an inability to trust, and not necessarily just Black people, but this country. Um, I, I would, I would think, I think about this all the time as I'm working with mental health professionals and physicians. Um, th there was a study a few years ago that talked about how physicians um, believe that Black people don't feel pain the way that other people do. Right, um, so looking at us as though our skin is thicker, or our bones are more, uh, are stronger, or we have less nerve endings in our skin, right? What that does in the context of interacting in these systems is that if we know that people are looking at us differently, it makes us tr not trust them, right? Not wanna be in these places where we have to interact with, with folks who are not gonna see our full humanity, which includes our capacity for pain, right? Um, the, the, maybe the last one that I'll talk about, or I, I wanna say these because I think they are really important. Um, Anti-Blackness can contribute to a sense of overachievement among us, right? John Henryism, the strong black woman, thinking that if we can just work hard enough, if we can just prove ourselves, right? Um, that maybe someday somebody will see the value in us, right? And what we know is that many of us actually can work ourselves into our graves as a result of that. Um, and then the last thing that I think becomes really important when we think about the anti-Black cultural violence is that it actually creates within Black communities an inability for us to value each other, right? And it sets up real standards around relationships um, that promote anti-Blackness. Um, if we think about sort of like the Black Lives Matter movement, there, you know, people um, point out oftentimes when we talk about that, we can talk about Black men, Black cisgender men, right? It can be the case that Black queer men don't get counted in that, or Black trans women don't get counted in that in those numbers, right? We really can focus on um, sort of like a standard because we're trying to ascribe to sort of like these Western ways of thinking about relationships and community and family without making space for allowing us to think about for allowing us to be as we are without conforming, right? So I think those are some of the ways that we get robbed, um, that, it, that it affects our psyche historically and presently um, when we think about anti-Black cultural violence. Wonderful. Okay, so this is the format that we're gonna continue on with. So before we leave the overarching question, would anyone like to add anything to this discussion? Okay, so we are going to move on to our next question. And Izetta, this one is for you. How can we imagine an ethic of care that while grounded in lessons and practices of survival learned and inherited from enslaved people must also imagine and build otherwise? Thank you, Shakia. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, I'm thinking a lot about what does it mean to imagine otherwise for us, particularly in the face of anti-Blackness or white supremacy or onslaughts of violence. And in many ways, we have inherited coping mechanisms and skills and cultural practices that have helped us make it through generations. And at the same time, uh, we have an opportunity to imagine practices that our forebears never even had an opportunity to imagine. So for an enslaved person to imagine being able to go to a therapist, right, that would not necessarily have been imaginable, right? So to me, I think of that question and I think about it as what are we bringing with us right, that we, we are inheriting, and then what are we creating as a care practice and an ethic of care and an ethic of um, mental health practice for us as we move forward into the future? Um, and that I think a great deal about what does that involve in terms of imagining? Is that reimagining how we think of community? Is that reimagining how we hold ourselves and each other accountable? Is it reimagining our relationship to work? 
Uh, as a scholar, I do a great deal of work around disability studies. It's one of my primary fields. And so I often think about um, how disability plays into how we experience the world around us and specifically anti-Blackness as well. So it's a matter of thinking about what does it look like to imagine a different way of being. I think a great deal about Adrian Marie Brown that I know uh, Carlton has already mentioned um, with the Pleasure Activism book, which is a fantastic book. Um, what does it look like for you to imagine your own wholeness and well-being? What does that mean for our community? And so I think of that too in terms of thinking about equity and practices of equity, that we're not solely thinking about anti-Blackness or this is what white supremacy does to us, but we are also thinking about this is what we do to heal from that. Um, this is what we do to include marginalized people within our own community to address homophobia or sexism, to address, uh, address ableism, that we are doing the things that make us healthy, whole people. Um, and I think that we need to, to take a moment to sort of paraphrase from Toni Morrison, um, who makes this, motion, uh, this notion of, before you get a little bit of power, take time to dream and imagine. So what does it mean for us to dream and imagine for wholeness that's maybe built on sharing food or sharing music um, and other cultural practices and then builds on new cultural practices as well? Awesome, thank you. Would anyone like to add anything to this portion of the discussion? Okay. I will. Can I can I say something about that? Um, I think that you I beautifully spoken, um, Isaiah. I really appreciated it. Um, I was thinking as as Isaiah was finishing up, it really made me think about um, the. I heard Kiese Lemon um, speak a few weeks ago. I've heard him speak a few times over the course of the the pandemic, and I, I think I might have heard him. He's actually he's actually in this this book by Tarana Burke and Brene Brown. Um, and he talks about how it is that we need to repair our relationships with our bodies and to really learn how to be gentle and loving and kind towards our bodies. And he 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 has talked about this in some spaces to, to like really think about what do I need to do to be more gentle, loving and kind or to repair my relationship with my left ear, right? Or my right foot, right? To really, really lean into this body is valuable and despite what the world is telling me about my own black body, how do I actively repair my relationship with it? Because anti-blackness is always going to try to separate us from having a wholesome relationship with our blackness and with our black bodies. So really focusing on how would I imagine on a daily basis being able to get up and look at myself and really do some reparations around how it is that my body has been devalued in this world, maybe even by me or people who look like me. Thank you, Carlton. Okay, so I am going to ask the next question to both Kiara and Kyla. What are the symptoms of trauma and how do we recognize them within the black community? So either one of you could jump in and start the conversation. Uh, <laughs> okay, I was gonna let you start Dr. K and I was gonna follow up. Um, but I think that trauma in, in Everyone has kind of spoken on it so much already. Just some of these things where we talk about how it affects your overall, your mental or your psyche. Um, but I think that trauma affects you in so many different ways. When we talk about the physical body, how it can, all of these elements that we see within our body all stem from trauma, right? But also not even just that, it truly just shapes how you, once you experience something, it's my belief that that has happened to you and you have, you become a different person. And now it's how do you shape and really form yourself around after this experience, right? So trauma can affect you in several different ways. Your ability to concentrate, your ability to focus, your ability to just be and see the world the way it is that you see it. Um, I once saw a movie, uh, it was called The Brave One with, I think it was Jodie Foster. And what was interesting was I had gotten robbed at knife point when we think about trauma. And I was I was working in a department store and there was robberies and somebody came in and robbed me at knife point. And immediately something clicked and changed inside of me that I had never been aware of and paid attention to. And I remember watching this movie in the same way how I showed up in the world 
it was difficult for me to show up that same way. So that is just when I think about trauma, that's something that I think about, but you can definitely elaborate, Dr. K. Thanks, and thank you for those beautiful examples. And you're right, that trauma, it changes you, right? So when we say trauma, you know, we I always try to think about the three E's of trauma. So there's the event, like that's what happens. That's this first E, and and so that's the thing that occurs. So it could be um, being mugged at knife point, or a car accident, or being shot. Um, but then the next E is the experience. How did you experience that event? So you know, and this is where we talk to young people and you know we could have 10 young people witness a murder in the community and they're going to have 10 different experiences of that murder so somebody may feel anger some may feel shame some may feel sad some may feel scared you know all of those and so those are the experiences from the event and then the last one is the effect how how is it going to impact them longer term not in that second but as we get further from the event. And so this is where we might see things like um, having intrusive memories, so flashbacks, right? And so you have a kid who's sitting at their at school and they're sitting at the desk and they're imagining that shooting that they saw the night before. And that means that they're not really attending to what the teacher's saying because they're thinking about what they just saw. And unfortunately, because of the way the school system works, many times what that leads to is the teacher yelling at the kid for not paying attention. Why aren't you answering me? I just called your name. Well, they were focusing on remembering that trauma that happened last night, and they couldn't control, they couldn't turn it off. That's why it's intrusive, right? Or they're having nightmares, so that then impacts sleep, which then means that you have a kid who has their you know, head down on the table at school and the teacher is saying, now you're in trouble because you're sleeping in class without stopping and saying, well, let's ask why that's happening. It can also have negative changes in thinking and mood. So uh, especially with teenagers, you know, if they're in that place of I'm supposed to be big and bad and I should be able to control my environment and something happens outside of their control, which is what a trauma is, then their whole self-identity gets questioned for them because they're not sure did they do something wrong if they were stronger could they have you know prevented it or fixed it or whatever yeah. um i think it's also important to know that because of systemic racism and implicit bias that many times black and brown people are misdiagnosed denied services or given the wrong service mm -hmm. so they're more likely a black man is more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than they are to be diagnosed with trauma and so when I'm working with young men every day who they can list 15 friends who have been killed, some of them in front of them, and they're not getting a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, it brings up a question, why, right? Why? Um, we also know that children in foster care, there's an overrepresentation of black children in foster care, they're more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, oppositional defiance and anxiety, again, not looking at the trauma. And so I think this goes back to what Dr. Green was saying is the dehumanization of the black body, that it is, oh, you can see your best friend get killed and you don't need to have a trauma response. You mm -hmm. don't need to have crisis response. You don't need mental health services, mm -hmm. right? In Baltimore City, there was a young man killed in the hallway of the school in front of all of their friends. And when I asked, okay, what's the crisis response? The crisis response was one day of mm -hmm. mental health support. But yet, have that happen in a white school, they got six weeks of 15 counselors sitting in the hallway ready to offer support. Mm -hmm. That is inequity. That is inequity. Yeah. Um, and so then finally, the last thing I'll say about this is, you know, as Dr. Green spoke about, you know, because of systemic racism and trauma, the trauma can look like anger and mistrust and aggression and low self-esteem and depression because this combination of racism and trauma is so dangerous and tragic. What it does is it, trauma teaches people that the world is not a safe place and yes. racism then blames the survivors for the trauma. Yes. And so we must look at the intersectionality of race and gender and sexual orientation and gender identity and physical ability and recognize that trauma, just like trauma compounds, so does experiences with oppression and discrimination compound. Mm -hmm. So you can't have this conversation without looking at the intersectional nature of trauma and race as well as all of the different social identities and how it impacts the person and the body and their spirit. I'm so glad you said that. Go ahead, that. Go ahead, yeah. No, go go ahead, Carlton. Go ahead. 
Were you going to add something? I will, but I'll do it after you. No, you go ahead. No, I, I just, I'm so glad that you defined trauma um, and outlining it, but particularly the intersection between trauma and history and the intersection of racism. Um, and that racism is a form of a trauma and what that does for people and the inequities that it creates. I just think it's so important to really define trauma and to define out how people experience it with the four E's that you went through. I think that that is so important, but also the point that particularly for people of color and for black folk, that um, we are experiencing a compounded and complex and persistent everyday experience with racism, which is traumatic. And though people find all types of coping mechanisms to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you can get to a place where Zora Neale Hurston said, I'm not tragically colored. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife, right? <laughs> that people come up with ways to deal with life, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. right? There's still this reality of the persistent, complex, and compounded nature of racism as a trauma. And in some ways, as I said, that was going to be the piece that I was going to add, that racism is trauma, right? And even as Kyla was posing the story, like, why don't we treat people um, for racism? It's really because in the, in the well-being community or in the health-related community, people don't see racism as being deleterious to the, to the health. Of, of people of color, right? And so without that, we are gonna be stuck for a really long time. There has to be more advocacy and more policy development in order to make sure that racism can be considered um, really dangerous to the lives and the health of black people and other people of color. I think that the other thing that's really significant about this too, um, and some colleagues and I wrote a paper some years ago called hashtag racial trauma is real. Um, and if you Google that hashtag racial trauma is real one word, you would find it. And one of the things that we really try and, and point out, and I was listening to us to a, to another person from the Brene Brown, Toronto Burke book. I promise I'm not trying to hawk that book. Um, but I was listening to Sean Genwright and he was, he, uh, he's a, a person who works with black youth in particular, and he has coined the phrase post-traumatic stress environment, right? I'm um, learning from his students who taught him that, mm, Racism is not over in my community, right? These events are not sort of like isolated events in my community, they just persist. And in some ways we have to think about racism that way, that it is an ongoing, persistent, malignant social ill that black people and people of color and white people are always contending with, right? So whereas you can get treatment maybe for being, um, uh, being in a car accident or your home burns down, right? Um, and you think about that as a, as a one-time event. Racism is not a one-time event. It's always happening around us. And so it is always affecting the psyche and the health of people of color. The one thing that, too that I always point out when I do my, my sessions around racial trauma that I think is also really important, especially in black communities. You know, we are getting better. We're talking about um, the emotional symptoms around um, mental health and trauma. I think that we also have to really be really clear that trauma, traumatic events, racial trauma, creates stress in the body. And stress is a physiological phenomenon, right? Um, high cortisol levels in the body mean that the body is really activated and it doesn't necessarily come back down to equilibrium once you've moved away from the racially traumatizing event. And we know that there's research that proves that for people of color. The one piece that I always point out for people, and it was uh, even uh, uh, became more profound for me during during COVID, is that um, when when there's there's research that says when Black people and White people experience the same types of racially traumatizing um, events, White people can leave the racially traumatizing event, and they can go and they can get rest. Their body comes back down to equilibrium. They don't have any problems with going to bed. Black people, on the other hand, our cortisol levels get so high and it doesn't necessarily return to equilibrium to the degree that our bodies don't rest the way that they would if we had not been exposed to the trauma. And so the cortisol levels have real implications for our bodies, not only for things like our sleep, but it can also promote like heart disease, lung disease, right? Bodies that are saturated in high levels of cortisol are unhealthy bodies. And so for us as black people, we also have to be thinking about the physiological, biological underpinnings of stress so that we can attend to those as well.
Yeah, if I could just add real quick, um, you know, I think that that all of that um, information and conversation is so incredibly important, especially the idea of the chronic nature of trauma. That's part of the problem with the term post-traumatic stress is that in the neighborhoods I'm working in, we there, there's no post. There's just trauma. It's just that's what's happening. You know, yesterday, you know, 15 people were shot in Baltimore yesterday, like in a in a block. Right. So this is this is constantly happening. And so when you you know, I always talk about trauma is sort of like if you have a bridge connecting the two parts of your brain, which allows the executive functioning to take place. Trauma is like water that covers that bridge. So if it's a one-time trauma, the water covers the bridge, the water goes back down, and that goes to what Dr. Green's point was, was that then you have rest, and your brain goes, oh, okay, now we can we can go back to executive functioning, our bridge is good, we're good. The problem is, is that when you have chronic trauma, that water stays covering that bridge. The executive functioning gets impacted, and then you have children who are children of color who are experiencing microaggression, systemic oppression, systemic racism, direct racism every single day. And that water just keeps being over that bridge. And so when we're talking about, and this is a, a, a big issue that I see in Baltimore, is that it's like, okay, well, we have to help the kids heal. We have to help them heal from trauma. They can't heal when somebody just got shot in front of their house yesterday. How do we do the healing work when they're getting re-traumatized all the time? And then they're in school systems where 50% of the kids in Baltimore City Schools who are in 11th grade are reading lower than a fifth grader. 50%. Why is that? Is there something intrinsically wrong or bad about those kids? No. And what we're seeing is the impact of trauma and that executive functioning being impacted and the healing services not being put in place. And so until we address the chronic trauma that kids are experiencing and the systemic racism that they're experiencing, like that schools are just like, well, that's okay. 97% of the kids are not on grade level. What are you going to do? Well, there's a lot we can do. And we know it. The research is out there. That's where the systemic racism comes in. Why aren't we using what we know works? And can I say something real quick, add on to that? Um, real quick, Dr. K, um, I want to you know, add on to what you're saying about how you said Everyone is experiencing trauma and it's persistent, it's persistent. But you know, from a youth perspective, and again, I'm 19 years old, but from your perspective, once that consistent trauma is being consistent, persistent, like keep going on and on and on, it's to the point where teenagers get to the point where they're numb to the pain. So when they see the pain that comes, you know, it's it's just like an everyday life, like hey, this, that's Baltimore, you know, and uh, you know, not to just not to basically discriminate Baltimore, but when you just said that 15 people got shot in Baltimore, I wasn't surprised. I was it's, it's kind of it's kind I was kind of already known about that, like because that's kind of my city, you know, that's kind of what the city is. That's kind of what the city is. Um, you know, I would say growing up from Baltimore, I would say it's not always, you know, in certain parts of the area, it's not always killing and trauma and killing and trauma. But, you know, once you live in Baltimore for a certain amount of, for a certain amount of days, a certain amount of years, you, you'll get to that type of, you know, your body starts to adapt to the environment. And that's a lot of things. That's the things that teenagers now to these days have to basically understand that we have to adapt to our environments, you know, and coming from, you know, different type of neighborhoods from West Baltimore to East Baltimore, where are two different places. Um, you know, and I just, I just spit a simple fact of, you know, West Baltimore, Frederick Douglass High School, and then going to East Baltimore, going to Dunbar High School, you know, there are two different students and there are two different students had, two different students have two different experiences and two different traumas. Um, East Baltimore, Trauma is way deeper than West Baltimore trauma. You want to be technical. And then you have your South Baltimore trauma. You have your Cherry Hill and your Brooklyn and your Patapsico, all those neighborhoods. And, you know, it just comes together where it's though that if all of our youth could come together and be, uni and be unified and have unity and, you know, that back to what Dr. Green said earlier about loving your body, we also have to love our soul. We can't love our soul. Who can we love anybody? You know, we can't love anything. We can't heal anything, you know, especially if we keep getting trauma persistent and persistent and persistent. We can't heal. So we can't heal. We can't love. We can't love we can't live. And that's basically what it is for the teenagers down today. Thank you so much for that. And so, Shala, I'm going to actually ask you another follow-up question. Um, so as a youth, what mm -hmm. do you think adults can do to support healing in the African-American community? Uh, well, this is a good question. And thank you for that question, Shakia. 
Um, I feel as though that, you know, back to, like I said, with Dr. Green said earlier, with loving your body, you have to love our souls. But um, I'm going to take us back to like 2009, 2010, whereas though um, in my neighborhood, West Baltimore, Gwen Oak, um, 2009, 2008, you had the Frozen Cup, you had the Frozen Cup lady, you had the Candy Lady. You had everybody in the block knew you. Oh, did you go to school today? How was your homework? What was what, what, when your next basketball game? You know, we don't have that anymore. We don't have the type of community love that we need. Um, I feel as though that, you know, in order for basically the adults to help us, they got to help themselves. You know, um, you can't help yourself if you're not healed. Um, it's like you're basically it's like how can you drink? A, it's, I got I got a metaphor. How can you drink out of a cup of how can you drink? How can you drink a glass of a cup of water when a glass is when the glass is broken? You know, um, I just want to say that because. It's like our community is broken. Our adults are broken. Um, the, the new generation that's coming up today has kind of grown too fast and kind of adapted too fast to the gen to the community that we live in. Um, I feel as though that you know once we find once once we find as though that that love and a community that we had back in two thousand nine, back in two thousand ten, where we had like more unity, more people coming together, more people basically, you know, not hurting each other, but also, you know, loving each other, lifting each other up. And I just feel as though that it's not that anymore. It's not, it's not the same way anymore. You know, after the Freddie Gray, after the riots, after, you know, all this stuff is coming back and, you know, shout out to Dr. K when she was talking about uh, racism is not over yet. It's not, you know, the jail system, that's still, that's still base. that's still slavery. Um, you know, how can you tell me, how can you tell me you want to take my freedom and make me work for my, how are you going to tell me you're going to take my freedom and make me work for under under low cut payments, that's not right. You know, that's that slavery again. So I just want to say that in order for basically the adults to help us is they have to help themselves. But once they help themselves, we have to find the unity and find our souls and basically come together and do it again. Shala, I'm so I'm so proud of you, and I am so happy that you are a part of this conversation. Thank that you. is another layer that we need to continue on this discussion this evening. So thank you, thank you so much. No, thank you. Okay, so it seems like we are transitioning into discussing more of healing components. So mm -hmm. this question will be for Kyla and Kiera. Um, what does a healed society look like? And everyone feel free to jump in as well. Um, so, you know, I love the work of Sean Jinwright and healing centered engagement. And that is what the Healing Youth Alliance uses as our North Star in how to help create a healing community. And so one, it has to be grounded in culture. You know, obviously the idea of, you know, the colorblind society is false and ridiculous and it does not exist. So we start there <laughs> and that we, you know, lift up and celebrate cultures and also focus on the strength. That's one of the biggest things is that, um, you know, a trauma-informed community is we understand that you've experienced trauma and here are the things that we're going to do so that you're not re-traumatized and we understand trauma. Healing-centered is we know you experienced trauma and we know that your strength, your brilliance, your talent, and we're focusing on those and we're lifting those up. And that it is a political social action, that it is taking healing into the action of going into the community and doing things like painting murals of heroes and sheroes in the past of your of your culture. It is doing the, um, you know, doing a conference. Shala is doing a one of the youth hosting a conference on June 29th where they have organized an entire conference to talk about racism and mental health and healing. That is part of what it looks like to do healing through the healing centered engagement. So I think if I were to say it in a sentence or two, it's a community where people are all working towards healing and preventing re-traumatization and that children are experiencing homes that are free of violence. They are attending schools that are healing centered. They're playing in rec centers that are focused on healing and they're interacting with community responders who focus on healing and not harming. To add to that, when I was listening to uh, Shayla speak as well as Dr. K, when we think about healing, um, I think about the time and the space that we're in right now. Um, and when you were talking about back in 2009, where, you know, people were checking up on you in your neighborhood and making sure that you were doing the things that you were doing, I can say the same for my past and things that we saw. And there definitely was a period of time where because of all of the things that were happening in our communities and in society, 
because we couldn't at that point in time, I think, put a name to it and call it trauma or the masses weren't able to really call it trauma. People were really just doing the best that they can and the best that they can forgot to look back and to really guide the next generation forward. And I think that with everything and all of the chaos and the confusion that has happened over the course of time, but specifically COVID, election season, he whose name should not be spoken, that era, it has forced us and really burst a bubble into changing and really looking at each other. So I live in Washington, DC. And in my city, I'm one of the few black people that still live on this block. And I remember there were times where people would just walk past and walk past and walk past and no one would speak. And then George Floyd happened. And we began having conversations about things that we were afraid to speak about. And so I think that we are working towards healing, but we, as the people that are doing the work, we have to continue to push this narrative and push these conversations forward. But we are definitely doing the work. I think communication starts it and just being honest and owning how you feel, what's going on, the things that you observe, speaking your experiences is what leads us to the next phase. So I am 2020 was difficult, but I'm excited for what it has begun to shake up in society. I'm excited for what you're going to see when you're my age. So I'm 32. You're 19. Where are we going to be as a people in the next 10 years? I cannot wait to see that because we have gone, we've gone leaps and bounds in a year. Mm -hmm. That's it. (laughs) And and to add on what you said, Ms. Holiday, um, you know, when like, it's like you said, like the world is basically, they stopped and basically helped the generation. I want to say they hindered themselves. And I would say they hindered themselves to the fact that they couldn't take on the new generation and how fast we was coming. Um, I definitely agree that our generation that we that I'm living today has grown up a little too fast for their own kind and that the society that we live in. And then, you know, bringing like my senior year is 2020, you know, the George Floyd and, you know, everything else that happened with the police officers and cleaning up, everything else that's happening, you know, in 2020, it was just like that one big compulsion of a year where it's though like, no teenagers, no middle schoolers, no elementary schoolers, no youth actually had no guidance. And when it, it's like, it's, it's kind of dangerous when a youth doesn't have no guidance, when a youth doesn't have a father or mother, a stable mother at home or stable education to actually work through, it's like they have nothing to go by. They have basically go through what they, they're learning what the world is giving them. And setting it, and setting your child in front of the new youth, CNN, WJZ, that is not also, it's not also, it's called healing. Because a lot of people say that's healing. Listen to the news, listen to what we can do next. No, if you want to do something next, we have to actually take the initiative, actually go outside and actually go to the, port, go to the, go to the port pit and actually basically start to work inside the community um to basically bring the community back we gotta have that unity and you know baltimore city doesn't have that unity baltimore doesn't have that unity as a whole and i feel as though that once we get back to that unity as a whole in baltimore city it can connect to the dmv and more so the dmv to bring it out because dc and, and maryland is not even that far away from each other you know and once once one happened other other side can balance it out but we're working on it in baltimore we're getting that unity we're gonna build it we're claiming it is already we're doing it well, I'm here in DC, so whatever you need, I'm available. <laughs> All right, come on up anytime. And the thing, right, that we really have to keep focusing on, even as Shalai is pointing it out, right? So we haven't been a unified people. There are so many thoughts that have been running through my head, but we haven't been a unified people. But what we know is that healing is in our community, right? We are our best healers. Um, I was with a with a panel yesterday, and they were talking about liberation psychology. And Dr. Tamar Bryant Davis um, kept repeating that there is a healer in you, right? And she was speaking specifically to people of color. There have to be ways that we get back to, I think community certainly is one of the most important parts of this. Um, So many, you know, black cultural experiences are grounded in the the notion of Ubuntu, right? I am because we are. Um, But what we have allowed really is for white supremacy culture and anti-blackness to fracture our communities and to um, cause us to buy into the myth of individualism as being the way to go. And what we know as black people is that that is not the way to go for us at all, right? Um, The other thing that comes to mind for me, even as y'all are talking, and I've thought about this before, but as y'all were talking, I was actually thinking like, for us to be here this evening, if you are a black person, you are a miracle, right? You are a miracle to have survived a school system that spoke really death to you. 
You are a miracle to have escaped um, your interactions with the police and you are not dead, right? You are a miracle to have um, lived through probably some type of poverty, right? Um, if that was if that was your situation. And we're talking about things that are, that are persistent, right? And yet here we are. Right. There is something even to go back to Shalal's word, there is something about the souls of black folks um, that really helps us to keep persisting. And so I, I totally agree. We, we not only have to be concerned about our bodies and our psyches and our, and our mental health, but we have to be concerned about our souls and our spirits. How is it that we keep doing things that nurture the very life source that lives within us? Um, that's certainly one thing that we need to be thinking about for our own healing. I love this idea of soul work. Uh, and this idea of being grounded in the soul work. And I also am thinking a great deal about historical trauma and what telling history gives us in terms of a path forward, in terms of agency. Because I think that there's a moment also where particularly black people are gaslit about the history of this country. And so therefore um, this minimization of racism, this minimization of systemic inequality and inequity, and then you begin to internalize also that so that we can't really look at history. And I think that part of what history can do is an adequate, complex, nuanced telling of history can reaffirm people's experiences or remind them of what um, might be true for them and then equip people with a sense of agency um, and a sense of a way to resist a narrative you know, Melissa Harris Perry talks about being in a crooked room. So how can history and really nuanced, accurate history right and level the room for people so that people feel equipped and feel like they're agents of not only their own lives, but of making history in a way. Um, but particularly I think about this gaslighting and co-optation and appropriation and that that too is, is um, decentering um, and how important it is to do soul work and how black folks have done that for centuries, thinking about practices. I always go back to thinking about Toni Morrison um, describing hush harbors and people going into hush harbors and having community together. I think about what it's like when a fellow black person compliments me on something I'm wearing um, and does it in a particular way. I'm thinking about the language and the way that we speak to each other and mm -hmm. speak to each other. Um, I'm thinking about the different ways that we say certain words um, um, and, and how that communicates. So just a reminder too that we are rooted in a culture that really can give us so much um, strength as well. Mm -hmm. Can I ask Azad a question actually? You okay. use the word gaslighting a few times. I'm wondering I if did. you can, can if you can make that plain for people and oh. maybe maybe even use the example of Juneteenth. Oh, oh, well. Mm. Um, I should ask one of you all who is a mental health practitioner to actually explain gaslighting, but I'll start and try my best and then turn it over to you all. Um, so the term gaslighting comes in part from a movie that was made in the early 20th century. It was a play and then it's made into a movie. Angela Lansbury is in one of the second versions of it. Uh, but the basic gist of this movie is that this woman marries a husband and he's trying to drive her mad so that he can steal her fortune. Um, and so he literally changes the gas light in the home so that it's never quite all the way up. Um, and so gaslighting is usually a term that means um, when someone tries to convince you that something that is, that something that is part of a reality is not true. Um, and they try to do that either through denial of the situation, denial of the facts as you understand them, um, minimization, uh, a restatement or reconfiguration of what is going on. And all of it is designed to destabilize the person who's bringing something up to make them doubt what they are experiencing or understanding or doubting their reality. How was that, Carlton, Kyla, Kira? Did it, did it get it? Okay. Uh, and so I think about, and I'm using gaslighting and, and thinking about history and gaslighting in particular around moments where people say things such as, um, well, really black people shouldn't be complaining. You've had a black president. And so we're now in a post-racial moment and everything is better. 
or when people sort of say, why are black people always complaining things aren't that bad? Or as someone who's done work at museum sites where there's slavery, I've certainly had people come in and say, but George Washington was a good master. And so I'm sure that the slavery wasn't that bad. If you're enslaved, it's not, it's not good. So there's no goodness there. So thinking about that as a form of gaslighting that gets particularly black people to minimize our historic trauma. Carlton, I don't know if that got to. No, that was perfect. I mean, it was perfect. I, I guess I, I think about the term and I hear it a lot. And, you know, I can I can talk about it from a clinical perspective. But oftentimes I, I wonder about people really getting the, the, the nature of what it actually means. Um, and even to think about right now where we're sitting, right? So we're in a country where folks are talking about critical race theory and they're talking about the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives Matter movement and saying that it's evil or that it's teaching white people to hate themselves. And, and like really um, in some ways gaslighting black people about the tools that have been useful for being yeah. able to um, seek liberation for ourselves. And then we turn around, right? And this very, the very um, US House of Representatives in the Senate sit even in this, in this culture or in this, in this climate where they are truly evidencing a lot of anti-blackness and then they pass a bill to make Juneteenth a federal holiday, right? Yeah. How is it that we have folks who are trying to recognize, CRT is about, let's talk about history and how it is that history has been viewed through a white Western male lens primarily to glorify their experiences, right? And we want to be able to tell a fuller story the way that you were saying earlier. And then, so we want to go down with CRT. We don't want to use that but we want to turn around and tell you that Juneteenth is important, right? Talk about right. gaslighting. Uh, right, well, and I would say, you know, critical race, the, also the redefining of critical race theory, which is actually coming out from Kimberly Crim uh, Crenshaw, uh, Marie Maksuda, Derek Bell, um, thinking about Patricia J. Williams. These are legal scholars who look at very particularly how the law frames race. And that's the place from which critical race theory comes from. Um, there's a difference and a distinction between critical race theory and critical race studies or the study of race. Um, and certainly there's this conflation and redefinition that's happening. Um, you know, I would have really loved for a Voting Rights Act to be passed and affirmed. Um, I, you know, I know this panel knows I have some feelings and some thoughts um, uh, <laughs> about Juneteenth, um, but I also think there's something to be said about when people are desperate to, to get you to forget or release or deny your trauma, mm -hmm. and then something happens where there's appropriation or there's a symbolic mm -hmm. gesture, mm -hmm. but the gesture does nothing to get to the core of healing mm -hmm. or addressing the historic trauma or the inequity. And that is a different kind of traumatic motion because you're literally doing, every, it's a pressure to make people relinquish the reality that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. It's all and and just to just to bring it back, it's also a form of gaslighting, right? To give you this um, symbolic thing without necessarily attending to what you're saying is actually hurting you, right? You should be grateful that we did this thing for you um, while ignoring what's painful. And I think you know when I was thinking about that last night, you know the the fact that you know, they passed this bill and said, okay, so yes, we'll make this a holiday, but they're not talking about well, where is the acknowledgement? Where is the atonement? Where is the commitment to becoming co-conspirators, to becoming allies? Like, where are, where is that? But instead, they're just like, but we gave you a day off. It's like, no, spend that day doing the work. Don't just take the day off. And that, I mean, that's, yeah, <laughs> just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> no, and I'm, I want to add to that, Dr. K, because when we were going back to thinking about a healed society, you know, we are doing the work, but the system is missing. So it's, we're gonna hit that wall until we come together. And it doesn't take much. We see it doesn't take much in order to do it, but it's just, it's gonna hit that wall until the overarching system decides to really own, acknowledge and repair. And, and Kira, to your point, I think it's really important. Like, what does it mean 
for people to create rituals of atonement and acknowledgement, not appropriate rituals that other communities have created, but really to create rituals of atonement, acknowledgement, um, commemoration, uh, and, and atonement. And I think that's so important. And, and in particular, in thinking about what it would have been to find out two and a half years after you are legally emancipated that you have been freed and that you had no idea. To find out two and a half years later. So that means that there are people who didn't survive that, so never were able to find out that they were free legally. That means that there are children who were born and people thought that they were still enslaved. That means that um, literally people couldn't trust the reality around them, right? Because who got to dictate the reality of what freedom was, right? Um, two and a half years after you're free. So really thinking about that as a commemoration and what that means. Um, I, I just think it's incredibly powerful to think about rituals, but who's, who is responsible for creating those rituals? And it can't simply be that we lift rituals from people, but rather we have to think about what kind of rituals of atonement and acknowledgement and care we have to create. Mm -hmm. And there's a real piece to this. Um, and I, I, maybe I can talk about talk a little bit about this, even as you're talking about creating rituals. And for Black people in particular, right, we have often had rituals around healing and how it is that we can survive um, in this country, whether or not you are into like a religious or a spiritual setting. Um, but even thinking about Black families and how they have certain rituals um, that have been really um, keen to passing down stories, passing down um, survival strategies, passing down recipes, you know, things that are, that are really supposed to keep us connected. To our black, um, to our black heritage, right? So, so rituals are probably everywhere, and sometimes we take them for granted. And so that that could also be another way of thinking about healing. How do you rediscover some of the rituals that have been passed down from um, our foreparents, right? Um, but even coming back to this notion of, of of rituals being lifted, what we know is that white supremacy culture is always interested in just perpetuating itself, and it will do it at the expense of anybody or anything in its way. Right. And even this notion of passing this Juneteenth bill in the current climate that we find ourselves in, we could even think about that using so like critical race theory to think about interest convergence. Right. Why is it now that after years of black people asking for um, to, to, to have Juneteenth acknowledged in this country? Why now? Right. Interest convergence teaches us that. Um, a policy like this one or, or a law like this one only gets passed because it has some meaning for white people, right? Um, it only benefits white people in some type of way. And so there are ways that we could be looking out for the argument to show up really for, for politicians to say, no, I'm not racist, I voted for Juneteenth. But what Isaiah is putting on the table is where is your vote for the, where's your vote for the Voting Rights Act, right? Um, and, and, and probably what we will see is that when there is some interest convergence around white people benefiting from that, it may actually pass. Thank you all so much for this discussion. We are going to transition to our audience questions. And we have one that I am going to read. Okay. so. Better to control a group of people than to deprive them of adequate health care, healthy food, sufficient education, affordable housing in healthy environments, clean water, livable single occupational income, mental health, mental health care, emotional management skills, equity, equality, wealth, justice, healthy, happy pregnancies. The answer to all of the problems in these communities are overwhelming, abusive policing. How better to keep control of them than deny them their right to vote, their pursuit of life, liberty, social justice, than to silence them as often as possible? So that was more of a comment. Do we want to address this comment in any way? I actually just want to, if it's okay, want to go back to one thing that Carlton said. 
um, which is that I also want to acknowledge that there are many Black Texans who exercise their agency around Juneteenth, and that that can be a both and, that people can exercise their agency around something and it can also be not enough, right? Um, so I just want to sort of acknowledge that. And I think what the comment that you just read, Shakia, is sort of getting to is sort of systems, right? All of the compounding pieces of these different systems at work and how Black people move within that and are able to exercise agency in some places and are not in others, right? And I think that that kind of comment sort of gets to some of that stickiness. And the person was referring specifically to, to police brutality. Uh, what I would be encouraging people to think about is looking at the, at the history of policing in this country, looking at slave patrols and how they are a direct um, child of anti-Blackness, right, in this country, and how policing has, has, has actually evolved in this country to do exactly what Shala was talking about, right? How to even maintain a system of second-class citizenry, how to maintain systems of, of, of slave, um, of, of enslaving people, um, really look into the history of that so that we can have more informed conversations about what policing means in this country and how it is that maybe we could do it a little bit differently. Absolutely. Very nice. Thank you, Isetta and Carlton. We have another question from the audience. Can you give examples of institutional rituals and atonement and commemoration? That's a great question. I think a lot about drum circles. Um, so I'm a native Washingtonian, born, bred, and proud, um, and we're all in the DMZ together. Um, at Malcolm X Park on Sundays, uh, there generally is a drum circle, and I find that an incredibly healing space. So for me, I wonder about the power of things like drum circles. Um, certainly it's um, Black Music Month, thinking about the power of music and what music grounds us. Um, I think about being in space with one another, right? Um, and sharing space. But I, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot during the pandemic, um, is how do we work with each other? So some people had the privilege of being able to work from home and some people did not have that. Overwhelmingly workers of color and black workers did not have that. But I increasingly think about from an institutional perspective, how do you engage with and work with the people who work with you? Like, what does justice look like for work? Do you overwork people? Um, is there transparency? Is there clarity? Is there compassion? I'm thinking a lot about how we do work with one another and how that can be a place of equity and justice. I'll add something really quickly. Um, I th the, the word is the word sounds big, right? Um, these rituals of, of atonement and commem commemoration. Um, and I think that sometimes we may overlook the things that are right in front of our faces, right? So think about black graduation, right? At a college or a university. I mean, that talk about a, a ritual that that celebrates black people. Um, or if you think about sort of like some of our, our some of our social organizations and how they sometimes do things within the community that are done every year or done periodically, that can be a ritual. If you think about your black family showing up for a family reunion and playing some earth, wind and fire, that is a ritual, right? Uh, or somebody just put into like doing the electric slide or or whatever it happens to be that is sort of like the, the, the part of, um, of the celebration or this commemoration that you know everybody will have some energy around, even those who don't necessarily dance, right? But you, you put on that music for the electric slide and it just sort of like galvanizes the community. We have to really be thinking about um, those everyday practices in some ways that are done within our communities um, that actually connect us to a history and looking back to our ancestors is a really important part of healing for us. But I, I would I would encourage people to just be thinking about looking around at what seems to be um, seasonal or um, quarterly or yearly. Like, like we have these rituals in our communities, even though sometimes we don't think of them that way. And if I can follow up, uh, even just daily, you know, one of the things that we do at Healing Youth Alliance is it's always connection before content. And that is, you know, it is about the collectivist 
model that we all have to connect as human beings before we can get to the work because that is the work right <laughs> you can't connect as all these siloed individuals but rather creating a community and so you know i always think of that as part of the rituals that we engage in is that we do check in before we get started with the contents of the day and i want to say one other thing about that because the person did ask about atonement right um what i would say is that in the history of this country we may not actually have rituals around atonement. Um, atonement really speaking to what Kira was, was, was pointing out. So like um, uh, uh, being accountable, right? Acknowledging, owning, apologizing, repairing. I don't know that we have a real history of sort of like institutionalized rituals around atonement in this country. Although, right, um, with the work of Brian Stevenson, um, the author of Just Mercy, which I would encourage people to read. He is really trying to advocate for how do we tell the truth about some things and how do we get people to be, uh, tell, tell the truth about racism? How do we tell the truth about racial terror in this country so that we can get people to be accountable for that, right? Um, so I, I think that, you know, we, we need to be dreaming up what, a, what rituals of atonement would look like. Thank you again. We have one final question. Um, thanks for the gaslighting explanation. I've heard it several times before, but didn't know what it was. It makes me think, it makes me think of when there is a video evidence of events such as when Rodney King was being beaten by police or even the January 6th violence, but some people will try to make you not believe what you see or even experience. So thank you for that comment. Um, and we are nearing the end of our discussion and it is hard to believe. I feel like we just got started. Um, but before we close out, I do wanna thank each of you for bringing your expertise and your vantage point to this discussion. Um, do we have any, well, no, let's go around and let's do final thoughts. So Carlton, we'll start with you. Well, I wasn't expecting that. Um, maybe, you know, there was a question that we didn't get to. Somebody wrote in, if this is so wildly known, I think they were talking about racism and recognized you know, racial trauma, what is being done to change these disparities. I would probably argue for you that actually racism as a factor in, in well-being or health is actually not so widely known. Um, you just happen to tune into a conversation <laughs> where there are people who are talking about it, who know a little bit about it. Um, but this is not something that's taught in most mental health settings or in um, sort of like um, where doctors are trained. The, we, people are not learning about this. Um, there was actually a study out just a few years ago. I think that in 2018, um, some folks down at Auburn University did a, um, uh, a study on whether or not mental health professionals were aware of, um, prepared to address and trained to address racial trauma. And the numbers just got lower and lower um, as you move towards the treatment. Um, something like maybe something like less than 15% of them reported that they could treat racial trauma. Um, it is not something that's actually well known. And so for me, I think that the, the thing that I would be saying for us is that we as a country have to move out of racism denial. Um, I think that um, there are some scholars out who are saying that that the race the denial of racism is actually the heartbeat of racism. It keeps it living, and so the more that we move out of racism denial as a country, the better off that we're going to be. And we actually need white people to be participating in this conversation and owning not necessarily that they have perpetuated racism, but how it is that they can be accountable for having the benefits for for being protected from racism, right? How do you use your power in order to be able to be in the conversation um, so that we are not necessarily tasking people like Shala and his peers with undoing centuries of racism? It is unfair to expect young people to take on the burden of that when those of us who are older have been benefiting, benefiting from it for so long. Well, I know you weren't expecting that, but you dropped the mic on that one. So thank you, Carlton. Um, Kiara? Oh, you're muted. We have an audience question here. Do you want me to read that? Or you just want me to wrap up? Because I can. 
Okay. And so the question that we have is how do we address interracial trauma, us versus us, overcoming that before we tackle racism outside? And I think going back to what you said earlier, Dr. Green, it, it has to do with that self-hatred, you know, that we that has been put on us. A lot of the violence that has happened in our community is a symptom of the years and years of violence that we have observed and seen and different things and opportunities and all of the things that happen, right? And so I think when we start working on self-love and loving ourselves, we begin to shift how we respond in certain situations. And so even in my day-to-day -day life, as I've grown and matured, I think about my life now and how I'll respond when I was a teenager. And it's quickly this, I have too much to lose. I've come too far and I have too much to lose to respond the way in which that I used to. But the fact of the matter that I am able to even see that is very different from a lot of people's experiences. I think that once people have opportunities and they have too much to lose and they have that love for themselves, that would then change some of their outcomes or how they respond to certain situations. When you have nothing to lose, you're ready to risk it all. And oh, well, if I'm, is anybody else want to say anything? Um, I guess. <laughs> uh... You definitely just touched everything I wanted to say. Like it's my like my final thought, especially it's like nothing to lose. Um, you know, I had took that recognition of myself now. Um, because two years ago when I was 17 years old, I would not I would not see myself sitting in this chair, you know, being on panel discussions, doing the things that I'm doing now, um, you know, healing for lions, heart smiles, you know, so stuff like that. I now I, I look at things different. And once I got to college, once I, you know, actually from high school to college, you know, I kind of saw like the transformation of, you know, actually me being a high school student to being a grown man and have to deal with my own responsibilities. So you basically just saying like have nothing to lose is like the, when 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 high school drama still comes up to my family or still comes up to me, you know, I look back and I'd be like, I have so much to lose if I if I try to basically respond in a different way. I had to respond in a way like. I can't take that. I can't take this. I can't take that approach that I wanted to take anymore because that's not who I am. I came from a mature person. So um, my final thought is basically it's time for you guys to shut out your old skin, you know, come into your new skin, be into anybody mature. Um, don't look back. Um, a lot of things, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people do this. They mature, they, they mature, they mature, they mature, but they always look back and be like, oh, I should have did this better. Um, don't look back. You know, once you actually figure out who you are and once you matured, keep going. Because if you look back, you're going to realize, oh, I could have did this better. And you're going to try to go back and critique the things that you should that you should have did better. Keep going, you know, strive for the greatness, you know, and don't stop. Thank you, Shala. And Thank I don't so know much. if I added my final thoughts, so I'll just say that really quickly and then I'll, you know, be finished. I think um, adding to what Shala just said, I think about when we talk about racism and we talk about trauma and all of that, I, it was, I think it's created to limit us. And so I'm just going to end with one of my grandmother's favorite quotes that I live by. And she just says, shoot for the stars. And if you don't make it to the stars, at least you'll be amongst the clouds. And so that's, we're bigger than anything and then what box they've tried to put us in. And so we have to continue to shoot for those things that we never thought that we'll be able to you know, be, do, and achieve. And so thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited that I was happy to be a part of this conversation. And this has really got me revved up for my Juneteenth weekend. <laughs> thank you, Kiara. Okay, Dr. K, final thoughts. Um, I'll actually circle back to what Dr. Green was saying, um, because this was one of the questions that we had talked about possibly is what role does the traumatizer or the system that inflicted the harm play? in advancing healing. And so as the white woman on the panel, I can speak to what the traumatizers need to do. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one, recognizing that America was founded on systems based in systemic racism and oppression. And therefore we have to revamp all the systems from top to bottom. We have to evaluate the policies and practices and evaluate whether they were meant to oppress or liberate. And when we find that those policies were there to oppress, then we need to change them and make them more liberation focused. 
Now, on an individual level, um, you know, white people need to recognize that we have benefited from oppression. We have benefited from racism. So the story of like, well, I didn't own slaves. Nobody said you own slaves, but we are saying you have benefited from these systems of oppression. You do not have to experience racism on a daily basis. So, you know, we have to start with recognizing the privileges, owning the privileges, and then we can start making a commitment to breaking down systems of oppression, removing barriers, and continuing to grow and learn to become co-conspirators and allies in the work of anti-racism. So thank you so much for having me this evening. It's been an honor to be along with these wonderful colleagues. Can I just say one thing before Isetta goes? Sure. Just to add to what Dr. K is saying, and white people, we need you to have courage. Take courage because you will need it in order to be able to do anti-racism work or even, to even be able to promote the futures and the lives of black people. Take courage. Thank you, Carlton. Okay, Izetta. Shakia, thank you so much for gathering this panel and for making space to have this conversation. Thank you so much for your moderation and for your vision. Um, I'm so delighted to have been invited and to have spoken with this wonderful panel um, and for your leadership, Shakia, and work. Um, I would say that I am thinking very much about history as a tool for justice, history and knowing one's history as a tool for healing. Um, and history as a tool to sort of dig out and really understand and resist gaslighting and resist sort of a changing of our reality. So I think I'm really drawn to, and I think this is Shakia, something that you've said before, history is healing work. And thinking about public humanities and history work as work that heals us, that reorients us to reality. And the reality is that race in this country has reverberated for centuries, right? And has created all types of trauma and injustice. And by really knowing our history and being able to look at that, um, that that is also, I think that's a ritual of atonement perhaps, is to really understand history um, and to really understand um, what that history means. So I think that that's sort of something that I'll be carrying with me as I think about all the wonderful um, things that we talked about today. Thank you, Isetta. Thank you all so much. And before we close out and give the program over to Dr. Dennis Doster, I definitely want to thank um, Dr. Doster for his vision um, and Artura Jackson for just helping and putting everything together. They're working behind the scenes, but they are really, they are the ones that are making all of this happen. So I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart for just bringing all of this together too. Um, so at this time, we're going to turn the program over to Dr. Dennis Doster and thank you panelists once again. Thank you. So I uh, thank you Shakia for your uh, awesome uh, moderation and then also thank you to your, the panelists for such a great discussion. So many great takeaways um, and really, I think it's a true example of how now, as we're on the verge of celebrating our first Juneteenth as a national holiday, this is a true example of how we make sure that that holiday isn't something that's an empty gesture, that we imbue it with these very important conversations that will hopefully lead to action as well. And so I thank you all for being a part of this. Um, a few uh, closing announcements. I know that one thing that was mentioned uh, in the in the panel was that there is the Healing Youth Alliance Conference, Healing Through Action on June 29th from 6 to 7.30, YouTube Live, Heart Smiles. So we definitely want to support that organization. Also, uh, we talked a little bit about music and the power of music to heal uh, in this conversation. And so um, our, our colleagues in the Arts and Cultural Heritage Division Public Playhouse will be, be presenting, uh, have presented a series of concerts, virtual concerts uh, for Black Music Month. But one that I think very much speaks to uh, this theme and subject is Cy Smith, who will be performing a virtual concert, Black's music, Black Music Heals, on Saturday, June 26th. And that will be streamed on the Arts PG Parks page. So 
Uh, follow us on all of our social media pages, our PG Parks, Arts PG Parks, and PG Parks History to learn about all the awesome content that we have. And then lastly, uh, happy Juneteenth. This is not the end for us. This is the beginning of a full uh, weekend of events. So tomorrow evening from five to seven, we'll be handing out free Juneteenth celebration kits um, at three different sites, Montpelier Art Center in Laurel, the Ridgely Rosenwald School in Capitol Heights and Oxen Hill Manor in Oxen Hill Manor. Uh, so please come out five to seven and pick up those kits. No registration required, they are free. And then lastly, on Saturday from one to three, we'll have mini celebrations at those same sites that will include arts activities, uh, special workshop uh, on stepping from Step Africa. Uh, you have to register for those. All the uh, information is on PG Parks, uh, uh, pgparks.com forward slash Juneteenth. And then also from one to three on Saturday, we'll be having a DJ battle that will be streamed on this social media platform as well as YouTube uh, and from one to three as well. All that information is on pgparks.com forward slash Juneteenth. So thank you all for tuning in this evening and kicking off our Juneteenth celebration uh, with us and happy Juneteenth.